All right. So I want to ask you a quick question here. It's a rhetorical question, but think about this. What was the funniest thing that you ever used outside of its original purpose? Just the funniest thing, the goofiest thing. You might not have a lot of material to work with because you don't have three kids that are five, four, and one year old, but I do. So I have a lot of great material to work with. Uh, my youngest son, his name is Quinn. He's one year old. Uh, you just, PT, you were just with him and love kids. He's, a, he's the man. Um, we have a lot of nicknames for him, and his newest nickname is Euro Quinn, or I call him Calvin Quinn, and it's because he's a little fashionista prodigy. So as you can see, that's Quinn. He has learned how to turn anything into a scarf. He found this sleep sack that he overgrew, um, and he just pulled it out of his drawer, and now he's wearing it around the house, kind of like a sash. Let's go into the next photo. Obviously, it wasn't used for that purpose. He took his uh, sister's dress here. He's got his crusty elephant in his hand. By the way, excuse the mess in the background. If you got a mess in your home, you can't judge us, okay? Because that's what happens. You, they tear everything apart faster than you can clean it up. I call them like the opposite of a Roomba. It's like they, they scurry around, and they just pull everything apart. So that's a dress. Let's go on to the next photo. This is probably my favorite one. <laughs> Goes into his sister Raven's room, grabs a hat, wears the hat. Obviously, his head was a little cold. And then, uh, <laughs> here's, here, this one's really funny. This is where the nickname Elton Quinn is coming into play. Let's go to the next photo here. My man Elton Quinn, wearing like a, like a grocery bag, like one of those uh, eco-friendly grocery bags, and his sister's glasses. Obviously, um, the kid is exploring things. He's, our whole house is this amazing kingdom that he can go and like wreak havoc in and do whatever he wants with, right? And he's adorable and we love him. <laughs> but I, I wanted to share this, this illustration with you because I was praying for an illustration that would uh, A, be lighthearted, but would also connect with the point that I believe God wants to speak to us about today because as we go about living this life God has created you and me inside of an entire universe that he manufactured by the word that came out of his mouth. It says in Genesis chapter one, verse one, that God created the heavens and the earth, and you and I live in his world, not the other way around. But here's what's amazing. When God created you and me, you know what he wanted? He wanted us to take dominion to be fruitful, to multiply, and to walk with him in the cool of the night in the garden. That was God's original design. God's desire was for us to walk in intimacy with God, but he also, he knew how he created the cosmos. You could think of God as like the CEO of the universe, the founder, the inventor, and as he is the inventor of the universe, he, as any good inventor would, has given us an owner's manual to understand how to operate properly in this universe. But here's the problem. A lot of us, ignorant of the word of God, corrupted by a curse called sin, rebelling against this God who created us, who loves us, who simply wanted relationship with us, we say, God, we're gonna do it our way. We don't need to follow your rules. And that is how curse, the curse called sin, entered the world, and that's the reason why we have death. That's the reason why we have divorce. That's the reason why we have disease and decay. It's not because God doesn't love people. It's not because he's not good. It's actually the quite opposite. It's because despite how good he is, we are rebellious in our nature. There's a gift specifically that God wants me to talk about today as we read through Solomon that we as a people have done a tremendous job at using in the completely wrong way. And it's the gift of sexual intimacy. And I think in a month like this, we're in the month of June, uh, and it should be of no surprise to people in this room that this, as the culture celebrates, is Pride Month. This is a month where there is a ton of conversation, not even at a, a discreet level, but at a mainstream and I would even say confrontational level about what is right and what is wrong. We read it this week in Isaiah. Isaiah said that there would be a time when people would call good evil and evil good, right, wrong, and wrong, right, and we are in those days. And so my attempt today is to teach a message that's gonna help us understand God's heart for this amazing gift that he's given us called sexual intimacy and to also show Satan's plan with this gift. 
I really struggled today, actually, like preparing this message, and I was backstage. I was actually weeping. I was, I was weeping, not because I'm afraid of kickback. I really, I can say this honestly, I don't really, I'm not afraid of what other people think because I'm so convinced that this is God's best. Like, hear my heart, hear God's heart. This is for his best for his people, for God's people. And so I know God's motivation behind this message, but, but what, I, what really frustrates me is how the enemy can take truth you know, he takes, here's the concoction, takes truth, takes a wound, takes abuse, takes hurt, takes disappointment, takes rejection, even takes Christians who have misused the scripture and builds a justification for an offense and deceives many. And there's going to be some people today that you don't want to hear this message and, and hey, I don't. I don't fully blame you. I didn't want to hear this message for the longest time. There's going to be people today that are offended by what I have to say. I would just ask that you give me the benefit of the doubt. And more importantly, give God the benefit of the doubt. I might fumble my way through this message. It's a really tricky one to share. But my, my heart is, is this, that you would know that no one's coming after you. We're not pointing fingers and we're not sticking our noses up. We just wanna break down the scripture because we know that the truth sets people free and whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. I also wanna let you know this. If you, if you come in today disagreeing and you leave still disagreeing, those doors that you came in through, they will still be open to you next week. We still want you to come back we want, you to be a, we want you to be a part of what God uh, is doing here. Now, I will share that if you wanna join a small group or wanna join a serve team, you're gonna run into this truth more and more, and it's because we, as shepherds, are, we are accountable to God to make sure that you're living God's best for your life and you're teaching others to do the same. So I, I, can't, I can't promise you that your capacity of leadership or influence in this church will grow if you reject this truth. However, we still want you to come and be around and receive because in his timing, he will make that revelation clear as long as you're humble. I believe it, I've seen it, I've lived it, okay? That's what's so amazing about this. This is a message that God has used for me personally, okay? I wanna share this too because this, this is a super interesting scripture about what we're gonna be talking about today. C.S. Lewis said this, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. I understand that this text that we're gonna be reading today and how, how I present it, it's gonna feel very countercultural. It is. I've posted some videos on social media recently of uh, just trying to help bring clarity because I see the enemy. And guys, we're gonna talk about this more, but we're not fighting. Uh, uh, people are not the enemy here. People are not the problem. Unfortunately, people are partnering with the one who is the problem, and that's Satan. Satan is deceiving many. We're fighting a spiritual battle here. But a lot of people, like I said before, think they've bought a lie for the truth. I've had videos literally taken off of TikTok by TikTok talking about just sharing scripture, hopefully from a, a gentle tone. I tried to, and they were deemed hate speech. I was restricted on Facebook and Instagram recently, wasn't even able to post. I tried to post something and I had a pop-up come up and said, we have restricted your account temporarily to protect our community. And then it said, okay, I couldn't even do anything. It didn't even tell me which post. But I'm sharing this with you guys today because what we're up against, there's a spirit in the culture. It's an antichrist spirit. And this is not something that we need to be freaked out by. Actually, Jesus warned us that this would happen. Jesus told us that in these end days, we're gonna see immorality increase. We're gonna see lawlessness increase. We're gonna see the love of many grow cold. And he didn't tell us this to freak us out, but to prepare us. Actually, it should kind of excite us. It should make us a little bit urgent. Because as we see this stuff happening in the culture, you might not even really be a believer, but you're like, you know what? This is kind of weird. This is like... It's getting really aggressive in the culture right now. These are all signs that Jesus is coming back really soon. So it's actually, yeah, 
It's super exciting. And I do want to share this with you. John 10, 10. The thief, the enemy, Satan, his purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. You know, he wants to destroy you through this area of sexual intimacy by perverting it, literally to destroy you and even to kill some of you. But this is what Jesus says. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And let me tell you, I would even add in, in uh, some brackets there, a rich and satisfying sex life. Amen. Amen. There are gonna be four things that we covered today. You guys can take notes. By the way, the title of this message is The God of Sex. The God of Sex. The idea, the heart behind this is that we return to the God who created sex and reject sex as our God. Because that's what we see the culture worshiping today is sex as God. Here's the four things we're gonna cover today. Number one is gonna be design. Someone say design. design. We're gonna talk about God's design for sex, his original intention. The second thing we're gonna be talking about is distortion, how Satan distorts sex. The third thing we're gonna be talking about is destruction. Someone say destruction. destruction. And how sex, outside of the, the confines of how God intended to be used, will reap destruction more than just some day-to-day -day benefits that we lose in our lives. It's pretty severe. And then the fourth thing is decision. Someone say decision. decision. God is a God, uh, he's so gracious. You know why? Because he gives us free will. PT talks about it all the time, the human condition. It's like, God, you're sovereign. Like, you knew that like, I would do this, yet he allows us to have free will to make our own decisions because love, true love, can't happen without free will. We can't truly love God back and worship him back unless it comes from a place of God. I want to do this. I genuinely want to return to you. That's why God gives us a decision. We'll talk about that at the end. I want you guys to open up to Song of Solomon chapter four. I wanna give you guys a little bit of context as we kick this off with our first point, God's design. Let me give you guys, I'm gonna nerd out a little bit, do a little bit of teaching. Song of Solomon is a song <laughs> written by Solomon. You probably figured that out already. Solomon was the wisest guy in this period of time. He was the richest ruler, and God gave him uh, so much wisdom where he wrote all these different books. He wrote the book of Proverbs. If you've never read the Bible, I'd actually encourage you, check out reading the book of Proverbs as like the first thing that you read because it's like a book of holy fortune cookies. It's like all of these little couplets, all these little riddles that are so practical and so encouraging. It just teaches us how to live uh, God's way in a very practical way. The next book that he wrote is a book called Ecclesiastes. P.T. did an amazing job on teaching on this last week. And it's an interesting book because Solomon wrote it after he had accumulated all of this wealth and he had hundreds of wives, hundreds of concubines, which is not God's best for sexual intimacy, let me just tell you that. But the point is, is that he had access to everything the world had to offer and it never satisfied. So the theme of the book was that pursuing all of these things is meaningless. And he comes to the end of the book and says, you know what is meaningful? To live a life that fears God. To live a life where God is at the center of everything and he's the one that we live for, not the pleasures of this world. Now, this book, Song of Solomon, is actually one of 1,005 songs that Solomon wrote. And so when it says Song of Songs, some translations say that, what it's basically saying is the same as when we say Lord of Lords, like Jesus is the Lord of Lords or the King of Kings, meaning he is the creme de la creme. That's what this, that's what this text basically is in regards to all of the songs that Solomon wrote. This is the best of the best. This is his greatest hit, apparently. So here's how I want you guys to be thinking about this as we read this, okay? This text is actually, was originally written to be read in a flow from beginning to end, okay? Doesn't mean that you can't pull out a, a single verse and get something meaningful or the Holy Spirit can't light it up. I mean, D-Money, the, the scripture you pulled from Song of Solomon for communion was beautiful. And so God can do that. God can do whatever he wants. But when we read this text, what's, what makes it really come to life is when we read it the way that it was intended to be read. Think about this. If you were to ever listen to a song by Beethoven or Mozart, a classical song, you don't just pick out five seconds of the song and dissect those five seconds. No, the point of the song is to listen to it in its entirety, and that is where you get the experience of the message that's really trying to be communicated. And it's no less the same 
with this book. The flow of this book, the story, the, the collection of love poems that you see is uh, basically the story can be summarized like this. There's a Shulamite woman who is in this love affair with a shepherd boy. And throughout the entire book, they're basically like chasing after each other. They're fantasizing about being with each other. And they are erotically romanticizing about each other as well, which is why we have the love kids wing. And so just want to remind you guys. Now, I want to read you guys some scripture. I want to share this first. How this book can be read or interpreted. Uh, historically, uh, is in church tradition, this book could be seen as the relationship, like allegorically or symbolically, the relationship between God's original people, the Israelites, and God. Like the intimacy that God wants to have with them. Man, what a fitting day that we did communion today, too. I just think, God, you're fun. You set all of this up in a such super intentional way. So that's how traditionally the Jews would read this book. Now, us as probably mostly Gentile or non-Jew believers in here, grafted into the family of God, grafted into the family of Abraham, completing the work that God promised for the Jews, we can read this as Christ's relationship with his church, the intimacy that he wants to have. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says this, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ Love the church. Our marriages, yes, they're for our benefit, they're for our blessing, they're for our enjoyment, but you know what they're also for? To paint a picture of Jesus' love for his bride. And the third way that you might want to read this book, if you're a Christian and you're married, is you can look at this as like a holy sex manual. That's what Pastor Chuck said. And I'm going to show you why. Okay, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Woo! All right, buckle up, guys. This is gonna be, this will be interesting. You are my private garden. This is what the shepherd says. My treasure, my bride, a secluded spring, a hidden fountain. Your thighs shelter a paradise of pomegranates. Amen. Please, you guys break the tension a little bit here. Ah, ah all right, with rare spices, henna with nard. Nard and saffron. I have these like spouses like hitting each other like, yo, let's apply this tonight. That'll be fun. <laughs> Fragrant calamus and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes and every other lovely spice. You are a garden fountain, a well of fresh water streaming down from Lebanon's mountains. The young woman replies, awake, north wind. Rise up, south wind. Wow, blow on my garden. And... <laughs> Guys, this is, this is awesome. Praise be to the Lord. <laughs> Blow on my garden and spread its fragrance all around. Come into your garden, my love. Taste its finest fruits. PT, you can't laugh, bro. <laughs> PT, that's not funny. This dude, back when we were doing Saturdays at Redeemer, my first message ever, he said, hey, Cap, you're up. You want to do it? And I was like, yes. Looked at the scripture. It was Leviticus 13, the law of leprosy. That was my first sermon ever. I looked at him this week, I was like, bro, I think this is worse than the one that I did back then. This is intense. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Well, hey, this is, what, this is what's cool. I wanna finish with this, because this is what it says in Song of Solomon, chapter eight, verses six through seven. It says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire. You can circle that. Circle fire in your Bible. The, braid, the brightest kind of flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. If a man tried to buy love with all his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. There's gonna be three things I wanna touch on right now that this book immediately speaks to me about God's heart for sexual intimacy, okay? Here's the first one. Number one, God doesn't blush at holy sexual intimacy. You guys need to hear that. We all need to hear that. God is not embarrassed by what you and your spouse do in the master chamber. It's holy, it's beautiful. Check this out, this is what it says in uh, Genesis chapter two, verse 25. This is in the context, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve. This is what's also kind of cool. As you read through the Song of Solomon, you're gonna see tons of imagery about a garden. I feel like there's, there's no coincidence. God is trying to make this connection here. And this is what God says after he creates Adam and Eve. He creates them. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked 
but they felt no shame. Adam and Eve were safe to express their love for one another in a holy union. I wanna tell you right now that God is not embarrassed. God, God is actually glorified when we come together, spouse and spouse, and we give ourselves fully to one another because it is a picture of the intimacy that God has with his people, amen. The second thing I want you to be thinking about is sex is a fire that needs to be handled with care. That's why I wanted you to circle that, that, uh, that word in the text. We use this illustration a lot, and forgive me if you've heard it a million times, but I just think it's so powerful, and we see it's actually, there's, there's a biblical reference to this. Sex is like a fire, and when you put a fire in a fireplace in confines of structure, it is beautiful, it is warm, it lights up a home. But as soon as that fire creeps out of the fireplace, it wreaks destruction on the entire neighborhood. And let me tell you this, some people will even be consumed with it. I think about, um, I learned this statistic, actually, my friends uh, Kevin and Bree, they have an amazing uh, marriage podcast. You guys should go listen to it, Reverence Restored. They're, uh, they're an incredible couple who have gone through so much destruction in their past and have seen God redeem. I want you guys to hear that message too. Regardless of what you've gone through or are walking through, Jesus is in the business of making all things new, okay? But one of the things they shared on their podcast that was really interesting to me, I forget what the statistic was, but you could imagine this is probably true. A child needs less to know that their parent loves them as much as they need to know that their parents love each other. I'm just thinking in a room this size, I can't imagine how many people grew up in a broken home. Grew up where you were convinced that your parents didn't love each other or your parents were split apart. And you've walked through the insecurity. You've walked through the heartache. You've had the sleepless nights. You've wet the bed because of the torment of not having security in the home. But what happens when, when, uh, when children right, grow up in a home and know that behind closed doors, their parents are healthy and they're connected and they're intimate with one another on a regular basis? It warms up the entire home, let me tell you that, okay? So that's, that's God's desire of containing and creating some guidelines around this gift. And let me show you, share with you this, number three. It's a gift from God that shouldn't be perverted by the world. Check out what it said. It said, if a man tried to buy love with all of his wealth, his offer would be utterly scorned. At this point in the poem, here's what's amazing. You got two, these two characters, Shulamite woman and the shepherd. This is where King Solomon enters the story. Literally, King Solomon enters as a character in this poem. He's been given everything the world has to offer, and his wealth can't woo this woman away from her love. Guys, this is the heart of why God has, give, has given us this message today, because the world is trying to offer us a counterfeit love that isn't gonna satisfy, that runs dry and leaves us thirsty. But our good shepherd has a gift for us that he wants us to access and relish in and enjoy with our spouse. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house? Thank you. I'm gonna need your guys' help today, because this is one of those messages, okay? Check it out, Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. This is what it says in uh, the book of Hebrews. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed, the marriage bed, undefiled. But listen to this. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That's what the whole scripture says. So there's a comparison here of what happens when we do this thing God's way and what happens when we step outside of God's best with this gift. Let me tell you that this perversion did not begin with people. This isn't a cultural issue. This isn't a political issue. Sure, there are people in the culture that are partnering with this lie, but let me tell you, this began thousands of years ago with a serpent named Satan. We are fighting a spiritual battle here, and we have to keep that in mind so that we know where to direct our anger and our outrage to when we see what's happening in the culture. People are not the target. We gotta redirect it at the adversary of our souls. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. 
Guys, I wanna share with you how uh, this, this panned out with the Israelites. The Israelites, these people chosen by God, taken out of captivity. They were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. God sets them free, takes them to the promised land where they could dwell with God for, for really for generation to generation, and they would get to eat the fruit of the land and basically live happily ever after. That was God's desire, even after uh, people, mankind wrecked the whole thing and brought sin into the world. But God told them, I want you to be a holy people. Be holy as I am holy. What does holiness mean? To be set apart. Holiness is not about being prude. It's about being pure. It's about being pure before God. He says, I want you to be pure before me and before one another. And so I don't want you shacking up with the neighboring nations and these other people. Because when you do, you're going to give yourself over to worship their gods. And their gods are false gods. You don't understand the spiritual implications of what you're inviting into your life by doing this outside of my best for your life. And like us, like Quinn, we take this gift and use it outside of God's original design. The Israelites, they were guilty of that. I wanna show you guys this picture. This is a, a, a statue of, um, of basically there's a, a goddess named Ishtar, the spirit of Ishtar. The spirit of Ishtar is the Mesopotamian goddess of war, fertility, and sexuality. And this was one of the idols that the Israelites began to worship because they were sleeping around with people that God said, I don't want you sleeping around with these people. But let me tell you this, behind every idol is a spirit. I wanna make that very clear. Behind every idol is a spirit. We, we are not just engaging in something that looks weird or is funky. No, we're actually becoming unified in the spirit with the spirit of perversion. That's what the Israelites were doing, and let me tell you right now, there is really nothing new under the sun. I wanna share with you guys how people would worship this false goddess of Ishtar. This goddess was said to grind away the masculinity of men and to turn women into men. In worship of this goddess, the priests were men who would dress up as women and walk around the temple wearing women's clothes and women's makeup. And parents would bring their children to watch these priests perform these rituals right in front of them, to do these erotic dances and things like that. Let me tell you, I mean, you don't need to open up your eyes for more than a couple minutes outside in the culture today to see that as it says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, that history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. You might be thinking, well, that's Old Testament. Like, I understand what God thinks about sexuality from the Old Testament. I've heard all of that law all my life, but I thought Jesus came to do away with the law. No, Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He came to give us a way so that we could actually fulfill the law. But this is what it says in Romans chapter one. This is the New Testament. I want you guys to hear this. 24 through 27. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. They took it out of the fireplace. And the men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. I want to share with you guys a a graph. I actually used this graph in a message a few messages ago, but I want you guys to see this. This is from Gallup. This isn't some from like a a fringe conspiracy theory uh, data mining agency. No, this is from one of the top tier data mining uh, firms in the entire country, Gallup. And here's what the poll shows. As you can see with these different colors, each color represents a different generation. And you can see like how many, what percentage of that generation identifies in the LGBT community. You have yellow, which is millennials, uh, green, which is Gen X, B, which, or excuse me, blue, which is baby, baby boomers, and purple, which is traditionalists. And you see that Gen Z enters the picture at 2020, and that's the red column, okay? 
Obviously, the numbers themselves are already pretty staggering. You see that in 2022, 20% of all of Gen Z, one out of five kids in Gen Z, identify with this category right here. But what I'm more interested in, honestly, as I look at this, is the exponential growth. If anybody here has ever taken a finance class or even just been to a math class, you can understand that if you were to take that timeline down 20 more years, what happens to that graph? What's happening? And let me also tell you, it's really easy to look at that graph and judge the red column and say, look at that crooked and perverse generation. But here's my question. Where were the parents? Where were the parents for that generation? We as parents need to take an honest inventory on ourselves and ask ourselves, are we so busy and consumed with our careers and the culture and our own pleasure that we've allowed our kids to be discipled by these devices and we are not creating a healthy structure in our home and teaching our kids who they really are? You know what this is? This is not just a sex crisis. This is an identity crisis. This cries out, I don't know who I am, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know if I belong. Will somebody notice me? That's what that communicates to me. And if they're not getting it from home, if they're not getting it by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know who who they're gonna get it from? Satan. God's got a plan for our kids, but you know who also has a plan for our kids? Satan does. I wanna show you some things that are happening in the culture right now. These are real things that are happening. I'm not saying that we go nosedive and into the news because there's, there's like no good news there. That's not the point. But we need to be people that can look at what's happening in the culture and watch and pray. Not point fingers. Watch, pray, and speak the truth in love. And model purity so the world knows what it's supposed to look like. So we're not a bunch of hypocrites walking out pointing our fingers at other people, but we're actually living this thing out ourselves. Amen. These are things that are happening right now in the culture. Just recently, a couple months ago, in Washington, a bill was passed, passed the the state's House of Representatives, that basically gives any kid that identifies as another gender than than their actual biological gender, they they are granted asylum by a government building, protected from their own parents, if their parents don't agree with what they're going through, And those officials will actually help that kid get a medical transition with taxpayer dollars. This this literally just passed the house in Washington State a couple months ago. This is the conversation that the culture is having right now. Another thing that you might be seeing happen on social media is parents and pastors at school board meetings opening up books that are checked out from elementary school libraries and reading them and showing the pornographic filth in these books. And these parents and pastors, as they're sharing, as they're literally just reading the the books that are openly available to these children, their mics are getting shut off because it's too vulgar for the room to hear. Yet it's not vulgar enough for kids to have access to in their libraries. Okay, I want to share with you a couple more. Female athletes being beat, women's sports being completely eroded because now biological men are able to compete against women and just completely dominate the competition. Why? Because God made us uniquely different for different purposes. God made them male and female, and he's not ashamed of either. They're both equal in value in the sight of God, but with different skill sets and different strengths and weaknesses. We see in Glamour Magazine, just this past month, just this month, a pregnant trans man on one of the most popular fashion magazines in the country. Target, you guys have probably seen what's happened with Target. Target promoting tuck-friendly clothing right at the front of their store for everybody to see when they walk in. And I, I hear my heart, guys, hear my heart. I don't want this to come off as like, look at how weird you are. Look, if you're struggling with that, if you believe in that stuff, I'm just trying to show you how much things have escalated in such a short amount of time, okay? To me, it's evidence that this is not, this is not a natural phenomenon. There is a spiritual agenda behind what's happening. I wanna share with you this final example of something that we see. The LA Dodgers, a major league baseball team, they chose to invite this group called the Sisters of perpetual indulgence, just think about that name, to their Pride Night event on June 16th, a public event for people to go and attend. And this is where, check this out, the connection between what was happening with the the worship of Ishtar. This is a group of drag queens 
dressed as nuns that do blasphemous performances mocking Christianity and Catholicism. They literally do performances where they're whipping Jesus. Jesus is being crucified on a cross and they're pole dancing on the cross. And you know who's invited to these events? Families and kids. Thankfully, there's people who are part of the LA Dodgers who have stood up and said, we don't agree with what's happening. We don't condemn these people. We love these people. But woe is us if we don't speak up and say, this isn't right. The enemy is coming after our kids. And I also wanna be clear here too. This message right now is not a message against a single community. Check it out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses nine through 10, it says, don't you realize that you who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Guys, this isn't a message about saying if you're homosexual, become a heterosexual. What this is a message about is you are an unholy people, become a holy people. That's God's message for us today. God is looking for us to become a holy people set apart from the ways of this world, because God wants to kill, kill our joy. No, because God wants us to avoid the destruction that's coming. I want to invite the, the worship team to the stage, because I know that we don't have a ton of time, but I'm going to try and wrap this up as quickly as possible. Destruction, the destruction that comes when we engage in sin. There's a story in the Bible, Genesis chapter 6. It's the days of Noah. In that story, it says that everybody on the earth was engaging in immorality and lawlessness. And when God looked at the earth, he didn't find anybody righteous, no, not one, except for Noah and his family. And it says that when he looked at the earth, he regretted ever making people. Is it because he hates people? No, but imagine the heart of God being ripped to shreds when the people that he created for intimacy with are just putting the finger up at God and saying, no, we're gonna do this our way. Imagine how that grieves the heart of God, regretting because of the heartache it caused him. He said, this is completely incorruptible. We're gonna have to hit reset on this thing. He judges the world with a flood, pours out water to cover the entire earth, but saves Noah and his family and a group of animals in a boat. You've probably heard the story before. It's not as clean as of a story as we often say in Love Kids, because this is a story truly of judgment of God cleansing the earth of its unrighteousness. But here's what's amazing. When God let the, the flood subside, when the waters came down and, the, and the, ark, the ark, the boat came to shore, Noah and the animals came off the boat. And you know what God did? Check this out. God put a rainbow in the sky. God put a rainbow in the sky. It was the first time anybody had ever seen a rainbow. And the rainbow, he said, this is my symbol of my covenant of peace with you. I want to show you that I'm never going to judge the world the same way that I judged it before. If you think about God being a judge and a mighty warrior, think about this bow as like an instrument of war. And he's pulling back the arrow and he shoots the arrow at earth, which is the flood, to judge the earth and to, and to cleanse it. But God's heart, God is more looking to be merciful than he is looking to be just. He's looking to be merciful. And God takes that bow and he hangs up the bow as a symbol of peace, saying, no more. I'm not gonna do it that way again. So when we see the rainbow, even though Satan would love to hijack this and use it for his purposes, we can look at the rainbow and we know this was God's purpose behind it. Despite our sin, despite what we deserve, God takes this bow and he actually points it towards himself. And we know how the story ends that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for all of us. He went to the cross for you and for me, died a perfect death for you and for me to be the blameless, sinless lamb of God, a sacrifice for our sins, to take on the wrath of God for us so that we wouldn't have to take it for ourselves. But Jesus also says this. We have, some, we have a decision to make, guys. Jesus says this. He says in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 42, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. 
We have a really warped picture of who Jesus is in the culture today. We, we think that Jesus, yes, Jesus came to love the world, not to condemn the world, but let me tell you, Jesus paid a high price for the world not to be condemned. He came once as a sacrificial lamb, but he's gonna come back as the line of the tribe of Judah. This is what he says. It says, in those days, in the days, in the end, it will be like Noah's days. And in those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. He's referring to the, to the rapture here. So you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. And though Jesus isn't gonna judge the world with a flood again, he's really clear in Revelation that he's coming with fire to start the whole thing all over again, to rid the world of this curse called sin, to create a new heaven, and a new earth. And why is Jesus pre preaching this message through me today? Why is this message going forth? Because he wants us to be judged? No, because he wants us to not miss the boat. But you and I have a decision to make. Will we take this truth? Will we metabolize it? Will we allow it to change us? Or will we stiff arm it? Let me share with you this. It says in Galatians chapter six, verses seven through eight, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Let me tell you, regardless of what you decide today, God loves you. You might be like, well, how can he love me and how can he judge me? Because he is love. He loves you. He created you for love. But you and I need to re reconcile with this reality. There is consequences to our decisions. And because God is a good and merciful God, he gives us free will and says, you can make the decision that you want to make. But here's what I want to implore you today as we close. That you would choose life. That you would choose life. The Bible says that he has not come yet, not because he is late or because he's, he's off doing something else, but it's because he is patient and is willing that no one would perish, but that all would come into repentance. Check this out. This is what it says in Song of Songs, the final verse, chapter eight, verse eight, verse 14. It says, come away, my love. Come away, my love, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. I'm gonna ask you guys to stand to your feet. Here's gonna be my simple prayer, my, my simple invitation. That regardless of the sin, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's fornication, whether it's pornography, whether it's adultery, whether it's lying, whether it's blasphemy, whether it's self-righteousness, you got it all figured out. You don't need God anymore. We can all be guilty of all of these things, but here's what God is inviting us into for the sake of re re reconciled intimacy with him, that we would come away. We would come away from the world and enter his presence and receive refreshment. So Father, we ask right now that you would refresh your people. If there's anything that you need to confess before the Lord under your breath, I would ask you just to confess it right now. Just confess before the Father whatever it is that needs to change. And Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus for a refreshment of your spirit to give us not just the desire, but the power to change, the power to walk in holiness, the power to walk worthy of the calling by which we've been called, the, the power to experience your best in our lives. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna give just a final opportunity before we close. There's anybody in this room that knows, you know what, I haven't been walking with God. I am a sinner. I don't necessarily identify with the sin that we talked about today, but I know my sin, and I don't know if a God is good enough, if God is good enough or righteous enough to forgive me and to cleanse me. Let me tell you that the blood of Jesus wipes away all sin. Let me read this for you right now. This is amazing. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, we just read this. It says that, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. Well. I want you to be thinking about that image of my son. 
pure, unmarked by the world, only one year old. You could see in his eyes just light and innocence. Let me tell you that in a moment, if you would give your life to Jesus, take the jump, take the broken life, and give it back to him. He will make you white as snow. He will redeem you. He will make you a new creation. He's not looking at just modifying your behavior. He wants to transform your nature. And the Bible says that when we are cleansed in faith by receiving the blood of Jesus, by putting our faith in him, we become a fit temple for his Holy Spirit to live in, which becomes the power by which we live this out. I'm gonna give you just one opportunity right now. If there's anybody right now, we're not gonna have the band play for too long. I'm gonna ask you Christians to pray for this moment. But if there's any person, even one person that would wanna come forward and receive this gift of forgiveness, to be refreshed, for shame to leave you once and for all, for fear to leave you once and for all, I'm gonna ask you to come forward right now. I just want you to come forward. If there's anybody right now, come forward to the front of the stage. I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. A prayer of repentance, a prayer of coming back to the Father and receiving this gift that he paid a high price for you to have to restore the intimacy that was lost. If there's anybody here, anybody that needs to come forward, amen. Well, let's, let's imagine that there's someone behind that screen because there's a lot of people that tune into what's going on here. We wanna give you an opportunity wherever you are, to receive this as well. So I wanna invite you Christians to be praying for that individual right now who's listening to this message. And if that's you and you know that you're done, here's a simple prayer I wanna invite you to pray right after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I need your forgiveness. I put my trust in you, that you died on the cross for me, to wash me clean, of my sin. I believe that you were put in a tomb and rose yourself from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. I need that power. Fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that honors you one day at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hey, let's celebrate in faith for those who are tuning in. So grateful. Hey guys, before we close today, I wanna 